good afternoon. I want to welcome you all right here to Kingdom Life Fellowship. Thank God tonight for all of our members as well as our visitors. Once again, it is Tuesday, 7 o'clock, and you know what we do again on a Tuesday afternoon. We're just going to bless the Lord. We're going to continuously uh, get back into our series of sermons. I love my church. Tonight we're talking about the church of Thaltara, uh, which is a very, very um, interesting church. And I pray that these series of sermons have truly blessed you um, in a way that you will take a different perspective, a different look um, about your church, not to bring so much criticism upon the body of Christ, because even Jesus applauds the church of Thyatira. Um, He talks about it and gives it, he kind of gives it his praise over here, but he also says over here, I got some things against thee. So that's why it's important that we take these messages here and we try our best to apply them to our churches in our prayer life making sure that God, again, wants you to uh, look down upon our church. I pray that you can see yourself in our said churches. Once again, thank God tonight for our visitors as well as our members. I love you. What a wonderful time. God bless Kingdom Life Fellowship to have Minister Ben Troublefield here. He preached glory down. Our men sung, and it was a wonderful time in the Lord. I had to be out of town preaching again and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and God has just blessed me. To be, a go, to be able to go um, outside of the county lines, outside of Clinton, to go and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm so honored and appreciative of a church body um, who totally understands the anointing that's upon my life. And I'm just grateful that God is using me outside of Clinton, outside of uh, these four walls. So I'm grateful for that on tonight. Our children went back to school last night or yesterday. I'm sorry, yesterday, went back to school on yesterday. So again, keep them in prayer, parents, the whole school staff. I, I kind of call it a war zone, and I hate to use that term um, on the school campus, but there's just so much going on. And there's a lot of battles that are being fought on the school on the school's ground, uh, whether it be in the cafeteria, whether it be on the playground, um, just, just so many places, our kids, our parents, um, you're sitting at that at the workplace wondering what's going on with your child, making sure all is well. So there's a lot going on. That's why I call it the war zone. That's why it's important that you pray over your child, pray over the, uh, the, the school, uh, pray over other one's kids as well, because they're going to need it. Be in prayer for our local pastors right here in Clinton. I'm excited for what God is doing in all of our churches, but I pray that we would long and seek more of him. Would you pray with me on tonight? Father, we love you. We thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your love, kindness towards us. We pause just to tell you thank you and asking you, God, tonight to forgive us of our shortcomings and sins, oh God, that we may have toward you and even toward one another. If there be any alt in our hearts toward each other, I pray before we lay down tonight that we would call someone, go visit them, and to get it right with them, oh God, so that we can be right in your sight. We love you tonight. We invite your presence to be in this service. Lord, we pray you watch over all of our local pastors and the leaders of these great churches, as well as our school systems, God. Just keep your hand upon Clinton, upon Sansom County, Lord, upon North Carolina, God, upon America, upon this world. God, you have the whole world in your hand. God, forgive us and have mercy upon us on tonight. We give you glory, honor, and praise for it all. We ask these things tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. The Church of Thar Torah. Oh, my God, I'm getting back into this. Revelations chapter 2 verse 18 says this, and unto the angel of the church of Thaltora, write these things, saith the Son of God, who have his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Now I, I need you to get this and understand that that on tonight, I want you to see the fine, common, thin line that God has given this church of Thyatira. Now, if you look, if you go back and look at all of these churches, there is some common thread um, that the Lord is telling John, obviously, to write to all these churches. Several things that God is repeating. The first he is repeating that I, I know thy works which means, again, I, I've always said this when we start in a series of sermons, as great as our service was on this past Sunday, all of you had a wonderful time in your said churches. But mind you, that's not the pinnacle. That's, that's not it. We've not reached uh, uh, greatness. We still have a lot of work to do. And that's why Jesus is saying in, in these um, churches, he's saying, okay, and this is to the church of Thaotora, of course, 
But he is saying on one hand, your works were great. I've seen many things you've done over here. You're doing a wonderful job in this area. But here, here are some areas that you need to clean up. And the word is like the magnifying glass. It reveals. That's right. The word is like the magnifying glass. It reveals unto us what we need to work on in our churches, corporately, um, individually. Certain ministries need to, of course, tighten up, get better. You should never be satisfied with what God did uh, um, in one Sunday service. You ought to say, God, I know there's more to you. We could, we could do a lot better. We here at Kingdom Life love to analyze our service on Sunday morning and and the executive board and myself and all of those who um, all of those who work within the ministry they're, they're always saying pastor I know next week I'm gonna do a little bit better here I I know how we could get better with this area I know what we need to do different you should always be like that and never sit back with your hands crossed and say okay we've arrived because there's still a work in progress and as long as there is a devil that's busy he's not on the loose God knows exactly where Satan is at. He's just busy. As long as he is busy causing chaos, confusion, turmoil in many of our churches behind the scene, we must be more aggressive in realizing that we could do better. One thing that Satan wants all of us to do is to literally just sit back at our church and applaud everything and believe that everything is well. The devil is a liar tonight. Everything is not well in my church. Everything is not well in your church. That's the purpose why Jesus is writing this letter. Well, John is writing this letter, of course, to the seven churches. Let's look over here at this church of Thalatora, which was a busy church, a well-known, popular church. This church um, was blessed with a lot of people. It was blessed with a lot of um, uh, trades. Um, it was blessed with a lot of, um, again, there was clothing making, there was diners, pottery. So there was a lot of busyness in this city of Thalatora, of this particular church that it was near. So therefore, the Bible says in verse 2, look at it. I want you to see in verse 2, verse 19, he says, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 19. He says, I know thy works and, and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. He says, I know thy works. Once again, that is the common thread in all of these churches. Christ knows what we've been doing. I'm telling you, he knows exactly what has been going on in our church. Your pastor may not take notice because he's busy. Your pastor may not see all the works that you're doing, but God sees everything that you do. He sees how you usher the little lady to the church, or he sees how you go and usher the lady, of course, to her seat. He sees how you are picking up the paper as you're going down the aisle because a kid left the paper down on the floor. God sees the little things that we do in church. And yes, he also sees the big things that we do. He saw how you humbled yourself and you sung that song and glory came down. He saw how, how the person who was supposed to pray didn't show up to church and you got up and you prayed and you did what God called you to do. He sees those things. So I don't want you to believe that there's absolutely uh, nothing in your church that God does not see because the Lord sees it all. Let me help somebody tonight. God sees everything within our church. Let me share it and go a little bit deeper. God sees and hears and knows every meeting that happens in your church. That's right. The person that sometimes you sit there and talk about, the person that you sometimes sit there and, and kind of criticize because they didn't do this, they didn't do that, or um, they didn't have this on, what you, you're sitting behind closed. Listen, there's no door that God can't walk in. Do you remember when the disciples were sitting there? Jesus had now um, been uh, had died. Now and the Bible says that, that they were shut in, but yet he came through the door. There's no door. There's absolutely, I know that door is closed and your leaders are meeting behind closed doors or possibly you're in the sanctuary and you're looking around to see is anybody. God saw, he sees, and he hears every conversation that is going on. This is why, church, we've got to be very careful and cautious at who and how we put our mouths on people. Could it be possible that our churches have been hindered? from the blessings of the Lord simply because we've been gossiping behind closed doors. We've been passing judgment on people. We've been too critical of people who come to our 
churches because once again sometimes it's because of what they're wearing because of what they did because of what they didn't do come on church we've got to get it to better get it together i believe sometimes and i say this with respect that some of us have been saved too long we're expecting perfect people to walk into a um, unperfect church that's not how it works people are going to come in and they may not know our church protocol so what if they step out of line it's not the end of the world it's not a sin if if they by some chance don't follow uh, the, the, the rule or not necessarily rules but the order that we have within our said churches it's not a sin oh God we think it's a sin sometimes when somebody coughs in church because the preacher is preaching why couldn't she cough when they were singing the song or sometimes a kid gets a little rowdy when the preacher gets to preach it and, and you sitting over there saying why couldn't they take that child out hey sometimes people just don't know they don't think like us in church we've got to be very cautious and careful of this Jesus says I know your works I know what you're doing. I know your frustration, but don't get yourself all worked up that you allow this situation now to come between all the good that you have done. He says, I know thy works. I know your love. I know your service. I know your faith. I know your patience and I know thy works and the last to be more than the first. Listen, the Lord says, I know your love and your patience. If there was ever a moment that we all need patience with one another in our said churches, it is right now. I pray that God would, would help you in that area of patience. Being patient with your pastor. Being patient with your leaders. Now, I understand the pastor and the deacons and the leaders of your said churches. I know that they are in leadership positions. But hey, if you are a Sunday school teacher, if you are the head usher, the head greeter, hey, if you are part of that ministry, hey, you yourself, you are a leader. So be careful how much, uh, be careful of how impatient you are with me. I'm trying to be patient with you and you trying to be patient with me. Let's, let's pray for one another. You know, I know sometimes we may see different in some areas and I know sometimes we may rub each other the wrong way with different ideas and different thoughts, but Hey, should, shouldn't the Christ in us rise up and be bigger than the conversation, be bigger than the thing I didn't do, be bigger than the thing that you didn't do that I kind of got offended by or kind of got upset. I want to talk tonight to some churches who said, Pastor, we need more patience in our church. We need more patience in our leadership meetings. We need more patience in our, in all areas of our ministry. He says, I know your patience. I see Thyatira, you are a patient church. You, you're trying to work with people. You're trying to, to work with each other. And I understand sometimes, again, so many people come to our churches and join ministries that, that have all kind of hidden motives. But God says, work with them, be patient with them. Most importantly, be patient with each other. You see, we can't be patient with other people when we're not patient with ourselves. I know sometimes people get on your nerves in ministry. That's why you got to inhale and exhale. That's why you got to inhale and exhale. That's why you got to have a prayer life because it's important that we not let the small things affect us of the big picture. Let me say that one more time. It's important in ministry that we not allow the small things that pops up sometimes in our churches to affect the overall big goal and the major goal, the big goal is that we represent Christ in all that we do, that, that Christ can be seen in our churches. When people walk in our church, they can feel and see his presence through us. Not so much through our works, but through us. Oh, that's I hope that's blessing somebody tonight because sometimes we can work and we think folks are seeing Christ in our works and sometimes they're not. It's when you are patient with people. That's that's how folks sometimes know, man, that's a good tree right there. And the fruits from that tree are good because they're patient with me. You know, right now, God, God was patient with you. In fact, God is still patient with all of us. The church of Thyatira, God is patient with them. If Christ was not patient with them, he he would have easily not warned them as he's doing here through John by writing. You know, he's he's giving them warning. And if Christ is patient with us. We ought to be patient with one another. I know your love, your charity, your service, your faith, and thy patience and thy works. And he says, and the last to be more than the first. Look at verse 20. 
Again, I'm in Revelations chapter 2, verse 20, talking tonight about the church of Thyatira. He says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Once again, it's not a lot of things, but it's just a few things. I'm grateful tonight that it's not a lot of things. Yes, that's right. But, but those few things that Christ may have against our said churches are things that we must now deal with. We can't wait to 2023. We can't wait. We need to deal with them tonight. This is what I said on last week. There should be an urgency in leadership. There should be an urgency within the angel of the church of Thyatira, which is the pastor. There should be an urgency to say, hey, we, we, we need to go ahead and put this on the table. We've been, we've been ducking and dodging this, this conversation. We've been ducking and dodging this moment. We've been ducking and dodging this decision that we're going to have to make. We need to go ahead and not give the adversary, Satan, any more room to cause havoc in our ministry, in our leadership. We need to deal with it right now. Shout out, deal with it, or, or better yet, type it, deal with it. That's right. You need to deal with it right now. Stop putting it off to next month. Stop putting it off to Christmas. Stop putting it off to, to November and saying, you know, we'll deal. No, deal with it right now. If you love your church like you claim you do, you will deal with all the conflict and confusion right now. It's just a few things. That's all. Jesus says, I got just a few things to deal with you because if you keep allowing these few things to, 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 to build up and to mount up, you're going to look up and you not dealt with them. And now they're going to start out to be a few things. And now they're going to be a lot of things. Don't allow the issues in your church to start out as a few and, and, and afraid to deal with them. No, prayerfully, we got enough God in us that we can sit down and we can go through them. Meet with your church. If it were, if the church has more of a voice, the body has more of a voice within your church, sit down and meet with the whole body. Stop being afraid and, and timid and scared to be concerned about the issue. If we got enough God in us, that's where... That's where I think we fell. I don't know if folks got enough God in them. I ain't talking about enough church in them, but I'm talking about enough Christ in them that we ought to be able to sit down and reason together. We ought to be able to sit down and respect each other's differences and find a place that we can meet at and say, okay, let's just meet right here. But mind you, even though you didn't get uh, uh, your opinion, um, your your stuff didn't work out the way you wanted, my stuff didn't work out the way we wanted, we're not going to let this issue get bigger than what it is, my brother. We're not going to let this issue get bigger than what it is, my sister. We, we're not going to leave this room. We're not going to leave this meeting here with anything in our hearts because, hey, I could go home tonight lay my head down on that pillow and that's it so I don't want to take no chances so therefore I don't have anything against you I wonder I wonder when will we get to that position in a meeting I wonder when we'll get to that position because Christ said listen you got just a few things that I'm holding against you now you're doing okay over here in your love. You're doing okay, church, over here at Thou Torah. You're doing good over here in your services. You're doing good over here in your patience. But I got a few things against thee. Let's talk about those few things tonight. He says, I got a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Jezebel here is reference to a woman. So tonight we're going to talk about the church of Thyatira who had this spirit hovering, resting and abiding within it, this Jezebel spirit that was teaching fornication, that was teaching uh, um, um, uh, yeah, fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto animals. I just want to go back there and tonight we're going to talk about this Jezebel spirit that hovers in many churches across this world. Now, mind you, to really dig deep, you would have to go back over there to, you'd have to go back over there to First Kings, if I'm not mistaken. First Kings will give us a full description on this Jezebel spirit. And we know that Jezebel in the first, I believe it's, in, yes, in First Kings, Chapter 16, you can begin to read in that, um, and it'll give you some insight on this spirit of Jezebel. How, of course, King Ahab was the husband of this uh, woman 
who possess this demonic spirit. Now, mind you, we know that in 1 Kings chapter 16 and 17 and 18, we see that this spirit uh, rests upon a woman. But mind you, this spirit of Jezebel is not genderless. I mean, it does not necessarily fall on women. So I don't want you to leave the belief that all women um, who are who has some characteristics of this Jezebel spirit, that that's it, that it's only for women. No, it's a spirit. So therefore, it's looking for a vessel to flow and to operate in. It's, it's genderless, so it doesn't really have to be attached to a woman. In this story here, the Church of Therator, as well as over in First Kings, we see this spirit connected to a woman. Mind you, notice what it said. It said here that she calleth herself, not ordained by God, but call herself. Be careful of those people who call themselves into the ministry. In other words, they appoint, anoint, and approve of themselves. Be careful. This is where the church has really messed up in so many areas because someone is your buddy, um, you've been knowing them for 25 years. They join your church and all of a sudden now they have a gift. Just because you have a gift don't mean that you ought to join the ministry. That's right. Because your motives may be wrong. Notice she called herself, not God. So in other words, this spirit is very selfish. It's real. Um, it operates in entitlement. It feels as if you are owe them something. Never mind now. You've been here grinding. You've been here doing the work of the Lord and they come in in an authoritative figure. This Jezebel spirit is very seducing. Um, it knows how to flirt and to win you over and to be patient. Yes, this Jezebel spirit is a very patient spirit. It's not always out in the forefront. It lurks behind the scenes. Remember, King Ahab was the face but the voice and the actions that took place was Jezebel. She was a wicked, the most evil, wicked, uh, um, the most evil, wicked uh, person um, that had ever lived. This spirit hovers in many of our churches because we know right now that there are some folks who love to take over. There are some folks who behind the scenes are, are whispering um, things through people and, and they have their own hidden motive and it's causing division, it's causing chaos, it's causing confusion. This spirit loves to be empathetic, loves to have that play that role that, that I need you to feel sorry for me. Because remember now, Jezebel over there in First Kings, of course, wanted everyone to feel sorry for her. She also had the spirit of religion because she had prophets, I mean she had prophets as well. So therefore, remember, and I'm over there in 1 Kings kind of giving you a visual description of how this spirit operates in a form of religion, meaning it can talk holy, it can say the holy things, it can do all the works within the church, not knowing that it's not doing the works that, that God has called it to do. It's only doing those works to gain personal. That's the pro that's the thing with the Jezebel spirit is personal gain. It's not so much overall about Christ It's personal gain is it's all the attention looked at me in one service. And then the next service gets upset because the light is not on them. And then all of a sudden they give this pity party. They didn't pastor didn't call my name or the leaders didn't call my birthday. It's always this and that. And sometimes I understand and get it. Everybody wants their birthday birthday name or everybody wants their birthday um, called out it was every now and then somebody may uh, uh, call your name for what you did in the church but listen you shouldn't be joining the ministry wanting any kind of accolades here on earth you ought to be wanting the accolades stacked up in heaven you shouldn't be just joining a leadership team so that you can wear that title and and when pastor calls up for all the leaders you're up there gloating no you should be doing it because you want to serve the reason why I'm pausing there on that word serve, because ultimately that's what we ought to be doing to each other. And if you're in leadership positions, that's what we ought to be doing to the people serving. But this spirit of Jezebel does not want to serve. It wants to be served in a way. So therefore, he says, listen, he called herself very seducing, knows how to use fancy words, knows how to 
manipulate. You know how it was, husbands, how you, um, and I don't want to use this term um, loosely by any means, but you know how you were you were doing whatever you had to do to win your wife over. You you put on the cologne and you, you dressed apart and you had a fresh haircut. Women of God tonight, you know what you did to, to attract your husband. You put on your perfume and you made sure that your nails were done and your hair was laying a particular way. This is this is how this Jezebel spirit will seduce and it will it will lure and pull you in if you're not careful. This is why it's important that every pastor, every leader, and even the members tonight that we have a discerning spirit. You can you can discern that Jezebel spirit from afar. If by some chance you have the Holy Ghost, the magnifying glass that can see some similarities of this spirit within a person, not necessarily a woman, but within a person. This is why we've got to be very, very spiritually discerned in this hour, in this moment, because this spirit can easily creep up in leadership. This spirit can easily creep up into the congregation. It can easily creep up into our children's ministry. It can easily creep up into, again, it can easily creep up into our usher's ministry. It can easily creep up into our elderly ministry. Hey, this spirit, this spirit is hovering in many churches across this world. It has caused so much turmoil, devastation in churches. It has split churches. It has caused churches to crumble down to mere nothing simply because nobody wants to identify that spirit. They're looking at the person, not seeing the spirit behind the person, and they don't want to confront it. But I want us to look at verse 21, and, and we're going to see how Jesus dealt with this spirit. Now, look at verse 21, and he said, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Christ said, I gave her that spirit. I gave her an opportunity. Like I said on last week, church, we're all on the clock. That's right. God is giving us, once again, that word repentance. That there is a common thread amongst all these churches. That word repented. Also, a common thread was, he says, I know thy work. He says, I've given her space. I've given her time. Now, if Christ saw the need to give this to give this this spirit time to to repent, shouldn't we give each other? Mm, I know this is blessing somebody tonight. Shouldn't we give each other space? Shouldn't we give each other time to repent, to get it to get it right, to maybe see the error of our ways? Could we be? Could you be a little bit more patient with your church and the leaders of your church? Now, nah, I get it. You're giving them time and hey, you may say, Pastor, man, a year has gone by and they've not repented. Pastor, uh, two years have gone by and he or she, they've not even apologized to me or to the church. They're, they've moved on about their married way. Remember, God sees their works. He sees how they have not repented. He sees how they have not seen their ways, not, not God's ways, but their ways, because that Jezebel spirit, it sees everybody else's flaws, but never raises its hand to admit it's wrong, it's false. So look, he says, of course, he says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. Look at verse 22, behold, which means take notice. He says, I will cast her into a bed and them that committed adultery. He said, I will cast her into a bed. Now, mind you, the, this fornication here of, of, of sexual immorality was very, very visual. It was very prominent for the church of Thyatira. And so mind you, God saw all of it secretly as well as the open part of all of this. And we've got to be very careful because when we fall in that hole, when we fall deep into sexual immorality, it takes us away. 
and not necessarily so much of, of course, we, we know the physical part, but even sometimes how we lust over things that's not of God, how we lust over our own desires, how we we're craving things that's not of God, craving things outside of his will, committing adultery against God because we're worshiping titles. We're worshiping positions. We, we're worshiping buildings. We're worshiping all kinds of things. We're bragging and boasting into what, what we're doing in our church. You know, it's, it's like we're committing spiritual adultery because, again, we're choosing everything but God. This is why we've got to be careful here, church, at who we say and, and what we worship and how, how much we give these things here. He says, listen, behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery, those that commit adultery. We got to be very careful because sometimes we feel in our heart and we may not even know that, again, we're worshiping these positions. We're worshiping so many things that's not of God. That still exist today. There are some people right now, I shared this with you on last week, that, that many people, believe it or not, are more prideful and more uh, um, hurrah in their denomination, um, in the title of their church, than they are at being a believer. So therefore, what people do sometimes unconsciously, because they've done it, and it's just the way that they've been brought up, that they're worshiping. They put more emphasis. They give more energy to their church name or they give more energy to the denomination other than just being a Christ-like believer. Yes, you know how it is sometimes that, that sometimes when, when the pastor, and I'm just using this for an example, when the pastor comes in, let's just say it's the pastor's anniversary. And yes, we ought to give honor and, and we ought to truly give honor to the God called pastor that God has blessed us uh, with and therefore, but we shouldn't worship him. The pastor comes in and everybody uh, uh, gives him an applause. And there's nothing wrong with applauding your pastor because, again, if he's called of God and he's walking in the anointing, he's walking in the biblical uh, um, standards that God has set and he's doing what God is called to do, you applaud him. But I, but literally, sometimes some people worship their pastor, some people worship their leaders, some people worship their church. And they don't even know that they're doing it, literally. Mind you, we are to give honor, but not to worship. We're to give honor, but not to worship. Don't allow your, your honor to lead you into worshiping a person. Who we should be worshiping is Christ and Christ alone. That doesn't mean I'm disrespecting my pastor, disrespecting the leaders. I'm not going there, no. But at the same time, they are just like me. They're humans. They are Christian men and women. And, and I'm not worshiping them. I, I appreciate them. I love them. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to do all the necessary things that the Bible says I am to do, but I'm not worshiping them. And this is where we are very careful. He said, I, I'm going to cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery. Look at verse 23. He says, and I will kill her children. That means God says, I'm going to put a halt to all of this because I do not want this bleeding. I don't want this to the church of Thera I don't want this spewing over into the next generation. This Jezebel spirit as it was in the biblical day when John was writing this and back over there in first Kings, it is still hovering in this community, in this state, in this county, in this world. That spirit still lurks through generations. And this is why church, we've got to be very cautious and, and it's time for the church to rise up and to be bold and to confront this spirit and to take authority over this spirit. Do you know that Christ died, that you and I can take authority over this spirit when it rises up in our churches? That's right. To take authority over it and do exactly what Jesus said, cast it out in the name of Jesus, out of the person and out of our ministry. It's important that we rebuke things that's not like God in your church. Don't you be ashamed. You're dealing with the spirit. It's not the person because sometimes the person doesn't even know that that spirit has attached itself to them because they have a form of godliness denying the power thereof. So therefore, to them, they're doing this church call religious things that they've always done, not knowing that that Jezebel spirit is over them, hovering them, whispering to them, giving them insight in a sense to say, 
do it this way, the same way that Jezebel was operating through Ahab. Ahab really couldn't speak on his own. He really couldn't move on his own because she was behind him as the queen, obviously his wife, doing and making all the decisions. But just like Elijah, who confronted Ahab, who confronted Jezebel, I pray tonight that the spirit of Ahab, the same spirit that hovered and rested upon Elijah would rise up in our churches and we would confront those false gods, those idols, and we would declare that we serve the God of fire. That's right. Just like Ahab or just like Elijah, of course, when he was on Mount, Mount Carmel. And of course, there was there was a conversation going on and the conversation led to a challenge. That's right. The, the prophets of Baal versus the God. And of course, we all know the story, the God who would who would consume all the sacrifices by fire will be the God. And that's our God, church. Mind you, that is our God. That's the God that we serve. So I'm coming tonight to, to help all of us confront, that's right, confront this Jazzy Bell spirit. He says, I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. That is verse 23. He says, and all the churches shall know that I am he. I got, I got one more verse and then I'm going to come to a closure. All the churches will know that I am he. That's, that's ultimately what he is saying. He is saying, and all the churches will know that I'm looking for myself within you. Church, to the church of Thou Torah, I, all of y'all will know that I am who I say I am. He says, I will kill her. God says, I'm not going to spare her. I'm not going to spare her children because I know that spirit will be passed to the next generation. And this is why, as I said a few minutes ago, it's important that we rise up and that we again destroy. We take it by the throat. We make sure it does not screw out that spirit of Jezebel. We deal with it. He says in her children, I'm, I'm going to get rid of everything that has attached itself to it. God says, I'm going to wipe out. I'm going to destroy it. And all the churches will know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts and will give unto every one of you according to your works. That's right. Every individual. We will all be judged. We will all be standing before God according to your works. That's just not the church of Therator, but it's us. It's our churches. We're going to stand before God and, and, and really going to be judged in the sense of how much are we going to tolerate this stuff. There's just some, some stuff in our said churches right now that we need to quit tolerating it. We need to quit tolerating. Let me go ahead and close. Look at verse 24. He said, but, but. Unto you I say unto the rest of thou Torah, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as I speak, I will put upon you none other burden. Listen, the depths of Satan, that means Satan will go deep. He will go deep. He's desperate. He's a desperate enemy. But remember tonight, he's defeated, church. He is a defeated enemy, but that does not mean that he will still not cause havoc, chaos and confusion in our churches. Satan is still busy doing what he was doing in these churches. He's doing it today. But God, once again, through this story here, through this church is giving us warning to deal with this spirit of of, of Jezebel that is very seducing, very manipulating, very patient. Um, flattery with words have a form of religion so many things behind this spirit and it's all it's, it's in our churches but sometimes when we don't see the word Jezebel written out on it we ignore it but this is why we need the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost once again will call it what it is it, it'll call it out. This is why I pray tonight this word right here has pricked your heart and you realize that this Jezebel spirit that worked in the church of their Torah is also or could be operating within my said churches. God, I need the Holy Ghost to reveal to me where is it? Where is this Jezebel spirit? Where is this controlling spirit? Where is this manipulating spirit? I 
I, I, I've always noticed it in leadership. I've always noticed it over here in this ministry. I've always noticed it, but now based on these series of sermons Pastor Henry been preaching about, now I see what it is. It's a Jezebel spirit, and we need to deal with it because if we don't deal with it, it's going to deal with us. And just like you didn't play with it, Jesus, we shouldn't be playing with it in our said churches. As we're getting ready to close, he says, listen, um, in verse 25, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. This is what Jesus says and in verse 26. And he that overcometh and keepeth thy works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Mind you, church, God is so much willing and ready and able to give us all that we need. In fact, we've already, we have everything that we need to overcome any of these demonic spirits, these demonic foes these demonic forces that are hovering in our churches, but we need to deal with them. And I pray looking through the church of their tour and understanding about this Jezebel spirit and how it works and how it operated and what it did in that church there and how this church here was warned by God to deal with it and what he said he would do. We need to do the same thing in our said churches. I pray tonight you've been blessed with this word. I pray that it has once again pricked your heart. Go back, share this word. Share this word with someone in your church. Share it with your pastor. Share it with others within your congregation. And hey, it's, I just want to stir up a thought within all of us to be praying and interceding for our church and to make sure that when, again, Christ looks down at our churches, he sees himself. Remember, judgment will start at the house of God first. So he's coming to look at us first. And I pray he finds himself in your church. And I pray he finds himself right here in Kingdom Life Fellowship. Would you pray with me on tonight? Lord, we love you. We praise you. We give you glory, honor for it all. We thank you tonight, Jesus, for your grace, your mercy toward all of us. We pray, God, just like the church of Therator, that God, all the good works we've done, being patient, you see in our faith, our love, our charity, and our patience with one another. We pray tonight that God, if that Jezebel spirit hovers within our churches, that God, we will deal with it. Just like you dealt with it and said that you would kill it, you would place it in the bed. You've given it time, oh God. You, we pray that God, we, we not deal with it. We, we, we give it time, uh, but yet God, you've called it out. And I pray that we're able to confront it and we're able to deal with it, God, and not put it to a side. We love you tonight. We give you praise and we thank you for being um, a part of this service. Now, God, may you have your way and be with us for the rest of the week. We give you praise, honor, and glory for it all in Jesus' name and all of God's people tonight say amen. God bless you. Make it a great week. And remember, I love my church. God bless you.